On the 3,651st day, we rested. Forgotten Realms! After ten long years of evolution, we've recreated the world. Behold, the Forgotten Realms, in all its magical mystery and detail. The land where many future advanced Dungeons and Dragons gaming campaigns will take place. Travel to new places like Waterdeep of the North, the greatest city in the Forgotten Realms, and the islands of the Moonshays, inhabited by unicorns, druids, and bards. The Forgotten Realms adventure set includes an invaluable 96-page cyclopedia, four full-color maps of this new fantasy world, the indispensable Dungeon Master Sourcebook of the Realms, and much, much more. Yes, it's taken us a while to get you there, but once you've been to the Forgotten Realms, you'll never forget it. Available at all fine toy, hobby, and bookstores. Welcome to Listener to Our Podcast. Jeff and Rook present Unpacking the Power Pack out of X Factor. Where we journey through each issue of the... Uh, wait, what? Go on. Okay. Most underrated Marvel series of the 80s while drinking beer. Analyzing awesome and amazing adolescent adventures and absorbing alcohol. I am Jeff. And I am x Rick. <laughs> 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 uh, that's nice. And those that tasted the bite of his sword named him Random Banter. Random Banter, buddy. Tell me a story. I was born in death metal. <laughs> I think it was Deathlock. No, it's actually not Deathlock. I'll, we were talking about that in our Patreon one of the previous thing. No, that is one of the... Uh, Testaments of the Doom Slayer, uh, which is from the uh, 2016 Doom video game, which, uh, oh my God, you have no idea how many of these episodes are, that we've done have been, uh, you know, work done by me while listening to that album. It is super, super good. It is really good music. If you're into uh, industrial, uh, post-industrial dark synth wave metal. <laughs> um, I can say that I am. I'd be lying, but I can say that I am. Okay, it's really good music. Yeah, it's I just, it's like two hours of just hit you know, uh, hit it and 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 never quit it. So <laughs> I will take your word for it. I it's not that I don't like death metal. It's just that I don't listen to a lot of it. I'm, I'm listening to a lot of podcasts right now, so I guess I don't listen to a lot of death metal. Yeah, this isn't even death metal. It's just it's it's instrumental. Oh, okay. all instrumental. It's just really great, and it's little interruption, little interrupt things in there where it's the uh, Doom Slayer Testaments, which is the Doom Marine or the Doom guy, as you might remember him right. being known as. Uh, where it's yeah, it's basically just kind of like hell made plaques to say, hey. There's this guy, and he's a big scary, and we call him the Doom Slayer, <laughs> and uh, he just, in his ravenous hatred, just kills people, and then we throw people against him. You know, it's, a, it's like, it's a testament of saying, yeah, we're demons, and we are scared. Run from this guy, because he just kills everybody. <laughs> well, on that family-friendly note, let's talk about, like, uh, some of the things I've done recently. Well, this last weekend, mm -hmm. I took my daughter out to go do some geocaching over in Beaverton area or the northwest Portland area. Hey, Hills. this is where we live. Yeah, a little bit further north yeah. from where you live. But I went up there, found a geocache, went to a park, and met up with one of our fans up there. Who did you meet up with? Jeff Polier. Jeff Polier! He's yeah. one of our favorites because we've met him, and uh, that's <laughs> not to, to say that our other listeners are not our favorites, but we've met this one, so we can identify him on site. Yay! Hi, Jeff! Hi! So, yeah, we um, went up there, and uh, his daughter and my daughter got to play around and on some of the uh, playground equipment, and they got to, you know, climb trees. In fact, uh, his daughter taught my daughter how to climb a tree, which I realized Damn. I hadn't yet. Huh. Just don't have a climbing tree nearby us, and so no, I get that. Yep, yeah, it just was a thing. But it, it yeah. takes it takes the right tree to be a good climbing tree, right. and not all trees are good climbing trees. Yeah. This when was I, a great one for yeah. that, and she was up and down it like a little monkey. It was awesome. When I uh, was a kid, uh, next to my dad's house, there was a perfect tree for climbing, and I say it was perfect because you could climb it up and get onto the roof of the second story. Nice. So you could get up onto the roof of the of the house from this tree. It was just like, oh, this is beautiful. So oh. yeah. The tree in our front yard was a plum tree, and that was my rocket ship. <laughs> I could climb up and down that thing. And let me tell you, when, when it got cut down, it was very, very sad. Yeah. <laughs> Even though by that point in time, uh, 
I couldn't climb it anymore. Yeah, you said I could climb. I could climb that as a child. How about now? Yeah, it kind of hurt. Don't I, I I climbed the heck out of the tree. Fell out of the tree many times. You know, fell out of the tree. Knocked myself silly on the concrete once, and and that explains I can't a really lot. Remember, it, it doesn't. How about you? Moving on. <laughs> Moving on, uh, both of my last weekends I've spent uh, doing uh, trips out of town. So two weeks ago, you stop me if you've heard this. Don't stop me, actually. But don't stop me if you've heard this one, Rick. Uh, went to the uh, beach, went to Cannon Beach with a bunch of friends to do our yearly kind of geocacher buddy friend uh, beach trip, bonfire trip that we do where we go caching and have meals together and walk the beach and fly kites and spin sparks and burn art pieces that somebody makes and stuff. And uh, then of the things you mentioned, I think we really only did maybe two or three of those. Yeah, normally, <laughs> normally uh, me and Hillary uh, have a house that we rent, but since we have a little two year old kiddo, it's just, it's a lot. So we just got a hotel and we pass the responsibilities of what we normally host over and our friends of ours. And their version of that was, we're going to be at the beach at this time. If you come over, that's great. Maybe we'll see you. Don't call us. <laughs> so, <laughs> More or less, that's about right. So we, did, so we did that, which was really great. And then uh, la this last weekend, just a couple of days ago, we went up to the uh, Kalama Lodge McMinimums and stayed up there for about four days just to hang out with friends and kind of have a little break away from here. But then we'd go over to the uh, Ridgefield Wildlife Refuge uh, bird sanctuary for their bird fest days where people get to see sandhill cranes and turtles and all sorts of stuff so i uh you know m most people do a lot of photography of birds so i took pictures of uh i'm gonna call them toilet toads but they were just tree frogs that i found in like outhouses which i thought was hilarious but then i actually found some i got some good photos of frogs not in a bathroom <laughs> all you did was send out frog pictures yeah i just sent out frog pictures it. yeah from, from, from a bird sanctuary yeah yeah, yeah it, was, it was funny to me just to, i'm like yes i'm actually at a bird sanctuary frog <laughs> Well, it sounded like you had a great time at that bird sanctuary. Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw some birds. They were cool. But you know, when you got a cell phone, it's not like you're going to... Here's the difference between taking a picture of a bird where you need like a big big lens and everything on a big full-frame camera and all that. Uh, with a tree frog, you can get to be like an inch from them with your cell phone and and just go, yeah, here we go, and click. Hey, that's a really great photo because I was able to squat on top of a critter. Yeah. yeah, and and that's animal photography for you is uh, the closer you can get to them, the better it is. And it is really hard to get close to animals because yeah. they're like kids. They they are just scattery. So, uh, tr you know, frogs, uh, you know, I had several jump away from me, but for the most part, they just kind of go like. Eh, eh. But the question that I think that all of our listeners have, and it's a very serious one to ask is, mm -hmm. well, it's a two part question. Yes. Did you try to kiss one? And did it turn into a prince for you? Uh, I did not. However, I did have somebody try and kiss me going, you've got to be a prince at some point, right? Look at this frog. That didn't happen either. No, I never tried to kiss a frog. I just kept... I like I liked this I like this story that you started, though, that I was kissed by somebody because they mistook you for a frog. Yeah, they mistook me like for that. a frog. Yeah, I they're like, like this... this Oh, look at this hideous, moist, warty creature. Oh, I bet they're going to be a beautiful prince or princess. Yeah, this is a lady's voice. I don't know. She's a trucker. I, I'm the, I was, I was going to say it's a trucker, and I was just going to leave it up if it was a man or a woman. Yeah, it's, it, it, there was a trucker, and they were like, this is going to be a beautiful prince or princess. I don't care. I'm going to kiss them so they can be human. And then they did, and I'm all, uh... Hey, I'm buddy, just... what's up? And they're like, it worked, except you're hideous. You look like a frog. Well, I'm glad you had a nice time. But now I'm going to bring you back to the reality of this comic book. <laughs> the reality of a mid-80s comic. Uh, the reality of a mid-80s annual that's not even an annual of the comic book series we are reading. You know what's fun about this X-Men annual number two? First of all, it's called X-Factor on number two, but sure, tell me. Uh, that's fun, too. Okay. Factor Factoring in its actual name is uh, the fact that it is the only X-Factor annual that isn't on Marvel Unlimited. So. Bummer for you. Yeah. Now, usually I would have Jeff give us a two-sentence replay from last issue, but, you know, this is a bit of a sidetrack. We decided to divert to this X-Factor annual, and it's a strange issue with a weird one-off adventure for X-Factor, a comic that Wheezy Simonson was also working at the same time while she was writing Power Pack, but this wasn't actually written by her. 
It just has characters that she was working on. Now we have seen X-Factor previously. They are a team of mutants made up of the original five X-Men. At this point, they are down to just four members. As this takes place sometime after X-Factor 15, where Angel apparently died. The annual guest stars Power Pack and Franklin. Well, Power Pack shows up for, like, the first half of the story. This really does not affect any continuity of the main Power Pack story, but does show a fun interplay with the kids and some other heroes in the Marvel Universe, as well as them getting together with Leech again. So, you know, now that that sidebar has ended, let's just skip the two-sentence replay, and I will just give you a beer. Your pleasure, my friend. Give me a beer. I will be happy to. (laughs) The name of this issue is Man in the Moon. Yes. Is it? I'll believe you. I thought it was not featured in Marvel Unlimited. (laughs) So I would like to give you a beer. Spaceman Double IPA, Boulder Beer Company, Colorado's first craft brewery, enjoyed since 1979. The stars have aligned for Boulder Beer Company's newest year-round release, a real vortex of bold hops and citrusy fruit notes. The pull of this well-balanced double IPA is inescapable. All systems go. Cause he's a spaceman waiting in a can. He's got some kind of artwork that has hops and tentacles. And yeah, it's it's like a, a hops satellite with uh, some spacesuited characters with hop parts on their sp- spacesuits. And it's all green and... I guess those aren't tentacles. Those are oxygen things. It's uh, they're like at a black hole, nebula, planety. It's a weird looking uh, art piece on that. It's cool looking, and I love the greens. The other thing I had on here was one small step for Boulder beer, one giant leap for beer lovers everywhere. Okay, Ooh. and yes, and since half of this issue does take place on the moon, I thought that this was a good choice. Nah, spaceman. Yeah, no, this is really great, and it's a nine point nine point alcohol volume. Yep. So with mm. eighty five IBU. Yeah, what is IBU? That's the International Bitterness Unit. Okay, so the higher the number, the more bitters. The more bitter. Is this a high or a medium or a low IBU for a uh, this double? This is a IPA? bit of a high one, but I always find that double IPAs they usually double up the malt as well as the hops, and so they tend to not be as bitter yeah. even though even though they do have a higher content okay i just did a terrible pour so i am a 70 percent foam on this one so uh apparently it's super foamy if you pour it poorly see whereas mine yeah you've got a nice head on I yours got a perfect yeah you've pour. got about an you got about an inch of head i am uh here i will describe the the lower two inches of my uh pint glass it is uh that's a nice amber color. It's a very honey color. It's very uh, trans transparent. I can see Rick through my glass. Uh nice small bubbles on it. Smell is nice. It's mildly IPA like. Uh I don't know. It, it smells kind of nice, but it, it a little citrusy, a little yeah. Citrusy. It does have citrus. I also kind of smell a kind of a yeasty smell in the yeah. foam. Yeah. yeah. So there's a little yeasty going on with that citrus. So kind of moldy oranges. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Okay. Uh, hmm. Uh, it's interesting flavor. Yeah, I agree on it. It it's got a sharpness to it. Yeah, and that what's weird about that it's that sharpness seems to like roll down your tongue. Yeah, but I'm not getting the uh, hop bitterness. Not terribly. It's there. It is an aftertaste. Right. It's an aftertaste, which we don't like. But it's it. There's something else that's really sharp in there. This the, the citrus. There's like a sharp citrus taste. A little bit honey. Yeah, I could I could see that kind of yeah. There is a little bit of kind of yeah, kind of a cloying sweetness. Kind of a, the honey is a good descriptor on yeah. that. Uh, yeah, it does kind of have a honey kind of flavor going on. It has kind of a yeah a citrusy nose mm-hmm. with some yeasty kind of smell. Yeah, that's um hmm. that's I know I say interesting a lot, yeah. but that is a good placeholder. That is an interesting flavor. I don't know if I necessarily like the aftertaste that this has, but it's I don't know if I like the foretaste that it. Has. <laughs> it's got a lot of different tastes. It's not yeah. It's not a horrible taste. It's just not a taste that I enjoy. Yeah. I'm not going to say odd good or odd bad. Just odd. Yeah. But I'm going to drink it. Because that's what you got. And now the opening credits, if you please. X-Factor, annual number two, 1987. The Man in the Moon. Credits, writer, Joe Duffy. Pencils, Tom Grindberg. Inks, Joe Rubenstein. Letterers, Joe Rosen. Colors, Petra Scotis. Editor, Bob Harris. Editor-in-Chief, Jim Shooter. Featuring X-Factor. Scott Summers, a.k.a. Cyclops, leader of the team, can shoot force blasts from his eyes. Jean Grey, a.k.a. Marvel Girl, can use telekinesis. Hank McCoy, a.k.a. The Beast, 
very agile and strong and smart, and he is currently not in the blue furry form that we are used to. He just looks like a human man with big feet and big hands. Bobby Drake, a.k.a. Iceman. He can control and create ice, and usually covers his body in ice too. Power Pack, a.k.a. Destroyer. Disintegrates matter, turns it into energy. Julie Power, a.k.a. Molecula. Mistress of Density. Controls her molecular density. Jack Power, a.k.a. Counterweight. Increases or decreases the gravity of objects he touches. Katie Power, a.k.a. Starstreak. Flies very fast, leaving a rainbow trail behind her. Franklin Richard, a.k.a. Tattletail, son of Reed and Sue Richards of the Fantastic Four. He has really nice prophetic dreams. Guest starring Pietro Maximov, Quicksilver. He runs really fast. And Lockjaw, a big dog that teleports. Also, a mess of inhumans, which is a mess we really don't want to get into. We start off with Franklin Richards narrating a dream. And you know what that means. Uh, no. What does that mean? We get to do the Wayne's World dream sound effects. Party on, Rick. Party on, Jeff. Excellent. Okay, so Franklin is walking through a watery mist, listening to a pounding sound that is getting louder and louder. He cannot see anything until he is swiftly picked up by a fast-running man. Franklin calls this guy the man in the moon, but we know him as Quicksilver, a sometimes bad, sometimes good guy who is always arrogant and hot-headed. This man in the moon continues to run faster and faster, taking Franklin up to the moon. But the closer they got, the louder the pounding until the moon fell apart. Franklin, that is so dumb. And now we find Power Pack sitting in Central Park, listening to Franklin explain the dream he had the night before. As if. While Katie is leaning hard into mocking Franklin in his baby dreams, Julie is a little more charitable, suggesting it may just have been a dream. Franklin is sure that it was a special dream. Alex takes the science and reason approach that it is impossible to shake the moon apart. Frank should check with his dad. Like, cha. Jack brings it down a level, reminding everyone that Frank is the youngest and that science stuff like that is too complicated for him to fully understand. Jack does offer Franklin some of his old Cody Davis Space Ranger books, which is nice, if a little out of left field. I don't know how to read, Jack. Katie swings back around to call Franklin a baby again, but grants that it was probably a special dream that he misinterpreted. Wow, these are supposed to be his friends and teammates, people that have seen his power in action. I feel really sorry for this kid. He really does not have a good support network. Uh, what about his parents, the Fantastic Four? They're a good support network, right? No, they are barely even on this planet, so I wouldn't even think about using them as a reliable resource. Ja, good call, dude. Actually, Alex does admit that they're not being fair. They really do not get his powers since they are genetic, unlike power packs, which are much more understandable in light of how they got him. Could you remind me how Power Pack got their powers again? They were given to them by a dying magic space horsey they had just met. Oh, but they were then switched around recently by a big green grasshopper alien. Yep, you're right. Their powers are much more relatable and understandable. But before these relatable kids can explore this mysterious Chekhov's gun-esque dream, they are interrupted by Leech and Artie. Hooray! Hooray! Leech is an old friend of theirs. As an unattractive mutant child cast out of society, he used to live in the Morlock Tunnels until the mutant massacre happened. He was rescued by X-Factor and currently lives with them and another young mutant named Artie. Where Leech is small and green and alien looking and can only speak in stunted English, Artie is small pink and alien looking and cannot speak at all. These two are best of friends. Leech could cancel the powers of anyone he is near. Artie can project his thoughts into 3D images. Artie is also very shy, so he runs back over to the two adults that brought them to the park, Jean Grey and Scott Summers. It is nice to see all of these characters out of their superhero costumes and doing something as mundane as going to the park. Artie interrupts the two original X-Men from a very intense conversation to provide us, and them, with some more exposition. Oh, great. More expositioning. Could be worse. We could be in Delaware. Delaware. Cool. First, Artie shows them Leech and Power Pack playing Frisbee. Interestingly, he shows Power Pack in their costumes. Next, he shows them the reason why he's not playing. He shows them a scene of the original five members of X-Factor in a sewer during the Mutant Massacre events. Then he shows them a scene where Angel is attacked and his wings are mutilated. You see, Artie is still worried that the Marauders are out there. Scott and Jean try to comfort Artie, and then continue to snipe and snark at each other. Because... X-Factor. 
Luckily, the rest of X-Factor, i.e. Hank and Bobby, show up. Artie wanders off with them while the battling Bickersons start arguing about what they are doing in X-Factor and why the public is mistrusting mutants and how they're adding to it with X-Factor. But this is not fooling Artie. He shows the other two members of X-Factor an image of the Phoenix. Scott and Gene are really arguing about the past that Gene lost. Oh, that beautiful old chestnut. Meanwhile on the moon... Home of the Fighting Blue Aryans. Yep, there is an area of the blue area of the moon that has a city on it. Not only does the city have an atmosphere, but it is populated by the Inhumans, a group of powered individuals who live in a monarchy type of society. Also, they have cheese. Okay, we're not going to spend the rest of the show making the moonest cheese jokes, are we? Mm, you better believe it. We cheddar get out of here. Mm, I Swiss things could be different. I uh, maybe... So there's a mess of people that are going to be introduced, and we're just going to run through some of them as they come up. There are a lot of Inhumans, and this can get really confusing really fast, so just hang in there. First up, we have a guy called Gorgon. Not Gorgonzola cheese? No, Rick. Not Gorgonzola. Gorgon, who has goat-like legs. He is tossing a small girl up and down in the air. This small girl is his cousin Luna. Luna's mother is another inhuman named Crystal, who is currently working with the Fantastic Four. And Luna's father is Quicksilver. Coincidence? Oh, this book is soaking in it. A couple other important people in the room are the king and queen of the Inhumans. Black Bolt, whose voice can level mountains. And Medusa, who has long, thick, red, prehensile hair. Black Bolt don't look too good. He has been having some massive migraines as of late, something he has had to endure in silence since a mere whisper could destroy buildings and possibly shake this cheese land to salad crumbles. Bogus! We also discovered that the reason that Luna is here is that her parents have split up and Crystal has left the moon and her child so that she could join the Fantastic Four. It seems that most of the Inhumans have a negative view of Quicksilver, just as they are confused by Crystal's actions. Meanwhile on Earth... Home of the Fighting Creepy Creepers. Specifically, Quicksilver and Lockjaw. Quicksilver is an adult male with white hair. He wears a baby blue suit with gloves and boots, with a lightning bolt sash and belt. He runs quick, but thought that the name Quick Runner wasn't as cool as Quicksilver. Lockjaw is an inhuman dog. He is as big as a hippo, looks a bit like a bulldog with a mustache, has a tuning fork coming out of his head, is fairly intelligent, and can teleport himself and others immense distances. Comics, folks! They are awesome. Now Quicksilver tells Lockjaw to stay before he runs over and quickly picks up Franklin. But, thanks to some quick thinking by Leech, the speedster suddenly stops. His powers are turned off as the little green guy grabs his boot. Ha ha! The rest of the pack start to yell, Stranger Danger! Well, not really, but they should. They recognize Quicksilver as an old Avengers villain and change into their costumes. But that is about all they can do, since they are in Leech's no-power sphere. They are as powerless as a werewolf on the night of a crescent moon. Alex takes charge and points out that they still outnumber the creep. See very, very quietly, Jack creeps behind the Quicksilver and waits on his hands and knees. <laughs> This little goof works well as Alex does a high leap and pushes the adult over. Unfortunately, Franklin is still being held tight. Julie recognizes that they can't keep this up forever, as Quicksilver is still bigger than all of them put together. So Alex directs Katie to get out of the depowered field so she can find Leech's friends and bring back help. As she flies away, she spies Lockjaw approaching, as do Julie and Jack, because big dog, big, big dog. <coughs> But Leech's power still prevents the two from escaping with Franklin. This buys Katie enough time to find Artie with the members of X-Factor. Of course, she does not recognize them because they are not in their costumes where they all wear masks. But they know who she is because Katie is in her costume, which does not have a mask. Also, X-Factor shares the same writer as Power Pack. So, you know, they got a little bit of an insider knowledge going on. The adults tell Katie and Artie to wait there while they go find some help. They run into the bathroom and pull a Superman. What, they're going to pull Jimmy Olsen out of some mess that he's in? What about Franklin? No, you fool. They're going to do a quick change into their costumes. And while they are doing that, we move back to this standoff. The kids are keeping Quicksilver and Lockjaw close, so they can't use their powers, which is working. But Quicksilver is experiencing some serious headaches. And after one hits, he directs Lockjaw to attack. 
This is done very reluctantly. It is like the big dog does not want to hurt anyone. Let me tell you, if these two were trying to win a villainy award, this is just not going to cut it. The judges want to see some action. You are going to lose some style points if the blood isn't flying. But his hesitation allows the heroes of this book to show up. Here comes the now costume up X-Factor team. Quicksilver recognizes them as the X-Men, or the Exterminators, or whatever X they are calling themselves nowadays. Now, in a special effects budget-saving scene that would make the CW proud, we have a bunch of costumed-up people who have no powers yelling at each other. We will demonstrate. Put him down, Pietro. Never, Cyclops. I said put him down, Pietro. And I said never, Cyclops. Rinse and repeat. Finally, Iceman tackles Pietro and Marvel Girl uses her telekinesis from a distance to hold all three. Cyclops is worried about Lockjaw and decides to have Power Pack and Leech move back. Which is pretty stupid if you think about it. But we want to help! And as soon as the kids move away, Lockjaw teleports Quicksilver, Franklin, and all of X-Factor away. Great. Just great. You kids had one job. Don't let Franklin get kidnapped by a super-powered villain, and you blew it. They could just blame Scott Summers. It is believable, and it's the truth. You make a valid point, sir. But the pack doesn't think of that. So as the kids fret about what they will really tell the Fantastic Four, we'll say goodbye to them. Because after 17 pages, their contract with this book is up. Yeah, probably some child labor laws that prevented them from being in the rest of the book. But we might as well follow Franklin and see what mischief he is up to now. <laughs> might as well. I mean, we got beer and time to do the recording, so who knows? Well, like you may have guessed, he and the rest of the teleported troop end up in the inhuman throne room on the moon. Uh, no, I would never guess that at all. Quicksilver is not pleased, and he calls Lockjaw stupid. Boo. Boo! Sir, we will allow you to be a kidnapper, a jerk, and a knave, but we draw the line at animal cruelty. Actually, I kind of would like him to not do those things either. And speaking of wants, Medusa and Black Bolt want to know what in the many meters of moon malarkey does Quicksilver think he is doing, showing up with these chuckleheads. Quicksilver rebukes her with some cheese-cutting remarks and then sees that his daughter Luna is there. This causes another massive headache to strike the speedster. Franklin checks on him and with a cry of, My mission! He grabs Frank and tries to speed off. You are correct about the tries. Everyone tries to stop him. Starting with Medusa and her hair, an attempted to tackle from Beast and Iceman, a TK shield from Marvel Girl, and an optic blast from Cyclops. He finally escapes thanks to another assist from Lockjaw. Speaking of the big dog, Medusa traps him under her hair as a jail. Both she and Gorgon are berating the criminal canine, trying to find out what is wrong with him when he teleports them away. That would not have happened if she used Tresumane. Why? It makes hair stronger. So X-Factor and the remaining Inhumans make introductions and chat about what the heck is happening and why no one has broken out a nice cheese board yet. They find it interesting that there is a Fantastic Four connection between Franklin and the two sisters, Crystal and Medusa, and the connection between Luna and Quicksilver. There is a big subplot here about Crystal and Quicksilver being estranged and how it matches up with Cyclops leaving his wife and child. This is a real raw nerve between Marvel Girl and Cyclops, and it is compounded by the fact that they are now standing in the area where the Phoenix, the being that took Marvel Girl's persona, died. Hearing all of this, Marvel Girl walks off to see if she can find the soundstage where they faked the moon landing. Or just to brood. Seriously, comics can be the soapiest of soap operas sometimes. That is a good -a call. Additional information is provided to the Inhumans about Quicksilver's recent return to criminal activities. For a while, he had been a good guy, but lately he has returned to his bad boy ways. With all of this info shared, the two groups decide to try and find their missing members, and, I guess, the kidnapped child. And after having another Inhuman show up to babysit Luna, they take off. Meanwhile in the bad guy's lab... Home of the fighting fiend of this fable. Hey, 27 pages in and we finally meet the villain, the man mind-controlling the speedster and the teleporting dog. Meet Maximus, brother to Black Bolt. He is the second in line for the Inhuman throne, and he is an evil jerk that can control people. Currently, he has Medusa locked to the wall in the most gratuitous and uncomfortable way imaginable. Franklin is allowed to walk around because he is a kid and powerless, you know, except for all the power that Maximus wants to use in the B-roll plot.
After Medusa and Maximus exchange some insults and even more exposition, Medusa speaks to Franklin. She uses her hair to lift up the little tyke and tells him she remembers him when he was a tiny baby. This is not helping. You have prehensile hair. Why are you not freeing yourself? Or at least even trying? Plot? Eh? Franklin, being true to his form in this book, relays his dream to someone else. But this time, Medusa seems to be putting some of the pieces together. Franklin's dreams, Quicksilver's behavior, and the fact that he is scared of his daughter, the strange behavior of Crystal, makes her wonder if there is a connection. Plus, there is the Medusa-ignored fact that Maximus said he was using mind control on Quicksilver and Lockjaw in front of her. But that doesn't seem to fit into her logic puzzle very well. Meanwhile, on another part of the moon... Home of the Titanic team-up. That's right. X-Factor and the Inhumans have finally assembled. Now that Marvel Girl has had a chance to brood about the Phoenix for a while, and to declare that it was a monster, or would that be a monster? First, that was bad. Second, this is a blow to Cyclops because he was in love with that monster. Awkward. But enough of that for now, because they know where the bad guy is. And so, they call out the combined cohort of costume combatants to canter towards the criminal's coordinates. The first to arrive is Amphibian, because he swam through the canal, which luckily flows directly through and into the bad guy's lair. Wow, probably should have protected that large open-aired entrance, Ace. Yeah, the security has some Swiss cheese-sized holes here. Maximus is bad at being bad. Dude is paying so much attention to his monitors and monologuing, he misses the moist merman. But he at least gives us some more exposition that Amphibian gets to hear. Thank goodness, as we haven't had any exposition in three panels, and I might have forgotten just what was going on. Anyways, Maximus is aggrieved because his family has called him mad. And so, he has used these machines to cause mental anguish to the Inhumans, inflicting pain and listlessness on all of them, and mind-controlling Quicksilver, Lockjaw, and Crystal. If you didn't get it the first two times, Medusa, he says it a third. He is mind-controlling people. Now he wants to focus his madness machine through Franklin so he can control him and harness the little boy's awesome powers for complete control of the moon. Okay, interesting plan. But unfortunately for him, Amphibian, unlike Medusa, was listening. And now he uses his surprise round to jump out of the water, grab the machinery, and toss it into the drink. Hooray! Hooray! Then Lockjaw grabs him and tosses Amphibian into the wall. Whammo! Boo! Turning him into cream cheese. Boo! This is followed by Team X and humans coolating their way into this part of the story. Maximus turns on his personal immediate area force shield and directs Quicksilver to take Franklin and kill him if it looks like anyone else might get him. Cyclops and Black Bolt lay on some blasts to the shield with their powers while Medusa and Gorgon are freed. Things are looking pretty shredded for the team bad dudes, so Maximus says to everyone that it is time to turn up the plane on Black Bolt, and also to mind control him. Then he tells Lockjaw to teleport Quicksilver and Franklin out of here, and go into hiding until summoned. Iceman freezes the big doggy, causing Quicksilver to start running. Beast tries to stop him, but receives super fast punches as a reward. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me. That should actually read many super fast punches as a reward. Biff, baff, biff, baff. Franklin tells Quicksilver to stop. The hot-headed speedster turns to smack the young boy, but his mind-controlled brain overlays the image of his daughter over that of Franklin. And it kind of breaks him. While X-Factor and the Inhumans figure out a plan to disrupt Maximus's force field, Quicksilver starts to think about all the lovers and couples who are fighting or are broken up. He thinks of him and Crystal, Marvel Girl and Cyclops, Black Bolt and Medusa. So you're saying that he was stopped with the power of love? Well, yeah. Duh. The, let's say, inventive plan to break through the force field with blasting and telekinesis works, and Maximus is captured. Amphibian is able to turn off the Madness Mind Control machines, removing the pain that was affecting Black Bolt, and possibly Quicksilver, who put down Franklin, said goodbye, and vanished. The weird thing here is that during the post-fight walk and talk, Medusa says she does not think that Maximus was mind controlling Quicksilver. But we can talk about that later. For now, we cut to Luna's room. The little baby girl is looking up at her father, and he is apologizing for his behavior, promising that he will make things right. And we get one last denouement, as Cyclops and Marvel Girl look out over the moon and are talking about Phoenix. Psyche has explained that he loved the Phoenix, whatever it was, and that Phoenix did love him. Marvel Girl says she is trying to understand, and then offers to go with Cyclops to pay her respects. And possibly harvest some provolone from that province. You know, we should just stop. 
Next issue! We finally get to a much lighter story as we move back to the Power Pack series and the kids take on Sunspot and Warlock from the New Mutants in Power Pack number 33, Special Effects. Let's talk about the themes of this issue, which is X-Factor Giant Size Annual number 2. First of all, we've got the cover, which is drawn by Tom Grindberg. And uh, this cover has nothing to do with Power Pack. Nothing. At all. No. We, don't, oh, we do have Franklin in it. There, there. Oh my goodness, he's the smallest oh. little insignificant figure in the world, down at the very bottom right-hand corner almost. It, it's pretty much all of the major players of this without Power Pack. Sadness. Um, you know, looking forward at Maximilian. And uh, there's a big Jumbotron. screen, Jumbotron, which kind of is a close-up of his face. It's fine. It helps tell the story, I guess. It's very dramatic. <laughs> yeah, I like how uh, it's, you know, Cyclops is on the left-hand side of the panel, and he's, uh, you know, the largest, and then it just really shrinks in scale as it goes down to everybody, and then uh, especially, you know, you have uh, Quicksilver on the very far right who's crouched down real low, so he's at eye level with Franklin, so they just continue to kind of decrease in size. It would have been nice if they had fit in Power Pack yeah. as well, but I could also understand... That would be yet four more characters to fit in here. But and they have it guest is starring the Inhumans. They could have put guest starring Power they Pack. They really needed to they do really that, too. To. Yeah, they had to do that, and they didn't. So I'm upset with this uh, cover for that reason alone. Yeah, boo especially, cover. Yeah, boo, especially since the very opening and, you know, the first, whatever, eight pages or 14 pages or something has Power Pack in it. Right, come on. Yeah. Don't so, bury the lead there, X-Factor. Yeah, so I'm, I'm upset with them for that. So, um... Some other random thoughts we got about this issue. It it is interesting to see Power Pack drawn by somebody else. Yeah. Um, I, I've got some some issues with how Power Pack's drawn, but I, you know it's just stylistic choice. Their jaws are a little too square for my taste. I, I do like seeing the kids drawn by other people, and I think that, that, that for the most part they're fine. You can tell who they are. Yeah. That's the important part. They, uh, yeah, it's different. Again, anytime you change artists, you've heard me squibble on this a bunch. Sure. It's like, it's changed. I don't like it. Uh, I'm getting more whatever. It's fine with that. Yeah. And this is very much in regards to that, where it's like, this is a different writer, a different artist, a different everything, but they, they pulled Power Pack in, right. which is fantastic because it's, it's so nice to see Power Pack brought into somebody else's story as opposed to Power Pack, you know, going, Hey, and Spider-Man's in this one. Can you please pick up our issue? Hey, um, you know, whoever's in Cloak and Dagger's here, you like them, right? Come on, come on over, come on over in our world. And it really, I mean, at least for the first half of the book, I think it really makes it feel that it's filled with other characters besides just the people on the cover. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we've got Power Pack, we've got Quicksilver, we've got Lockjaw, uh, we've got X Factor, who are, you know, in their civilian clothes, we've got Leech, we've got. RD. Random, but we got random people running around the park, and then at the, the last half is all in humans, and then it just gets off the rails. But <laughs> but for the first half, I really do appreciate having them all in there, and I do like I do like Tom Grinberg's art style. I I, I want to say it's kind of like there's there's some seventies feels to it. I, I don't know what I don't know why I'm saying uh, that. I could kind of see that. I think due to clothing and dress. Yeah, I could see that being uh, why you could see it having kind of a seventies vibe. Some of the close up faces I think are. Very very artistic and very, uh, very good. I, I guess is what I'm just trying to get to. There, there, there's a style, really interesting style that he's got when he draws close-up faces, and I think it, I, I enjoy those a little bit more. Um, does good job on the background work. So I, overall, I, I like how it all works together. The storyline itself, there's a lot that goes on here. A lot. It is almost a jumbled mess with just how much stuff is uh, trying to be covered and carried over on here. I think this would have been a better two or three issue. Yeah, mini story. Yeah, it could have been a, a four-parter. Right. That, you know, cross it over with Power Pack, cross it over with the X Factor, end up in the annual where it's like, you know, you got them all mixed together and involved in this caper on the moon. Yeah. I think that would have been a little bit a, a better use of the story and, and we'd been able to follow through with the characters a bit more. Yeah, this issue has a lot of thought bubbles it is just got so much exposition it is ridiculous with exposition and in fact it, it's so hard for them to get away from it that they have a massive exposition they show a picture of like triton swimming and then it's just another exposition dump right. it is five aaron sorkin <laughs> episodes shoved into one and you've got a lot of backstory, a lot of real deep Marvel comics, 
bellow drama that is all built in here. It has lore in there that I don't even remember. Right. And, I mean, you're dealing with a lot of backstory. You're dealing with a lot of Fantastic Four backstory of why these characters uh, even matter. You know, why Crystal is, is over as part of Fantastic Four right now. Oh, Medusa used to be part of Fantastic Four. Got X Factor lore. Got the entire Dark Phoenix saga. You've got Scott leaving his wife and going off to be with X Factor and to being with Jean because Jean's back from the dead. Got all this crazy, crazy stuff going on, and we're just looking for something to distract us. <laughs> there's a lot that's here. Yeah. So it's just. And, and then there's other things too. It's like apparently. Iceman can't use his powers, otherwise it overwhelms him. Right. Oh, uh, what's that about? That, it's that, got. That, you know, it's, I can tell you everything that deals with it because there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been happening with Iceman back in X Factor, where he's actually gone, and he was kidnapped by Ice Giants and Loki, and Thor had to save him, and his powers got out of whack. Okay. They are, they're pulling in so much crazy stuff that unless you are deep, deep in Marvel comics, you aren't going to get it. Got it all in here. Yeah. You don't need all of it. Yeah, it's 48 pages of too much stuff. Yeah. There's there's a lot. I mean, thank you very much for recognizing that these things have all happened to these characters. But putting it all in here and having all the characters' actions trying to react against it, it gets real confusing. And it's real dense. Yeah. We cut a lot of stuff out of the synopsis rather on it. <laughs> just because it's like, I want to just get through the, 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 the main plot of the story as best we could so and of course part of this too is we have medusa not believing that maximus was controlling that angered me so much <laughs> because she's there she has literally heard uh, maximus talking about his ha 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 my mind controlled slaves quicksilver crystal and lockjaw using my mind control to mind control and then when black bolt comes here i will mind control him because i've been using my mind control device to hurt his brain and make people act weird i brought suffering and misery on everybody's mind with my mind control ability ha ha look quicksilver my mind controlled <laughs> mind controlled so mind control <laughs> As you can see, there's so much. And she's all like, I don't think he's mind controlled. She ignored it perpetually and it was thrown in her face like four times. So Medusa's got issues. Sure, issues. Yeah, issues. Angry to me issues where it just the blinders are ridiculous. The inhumans on a whole, they're interesting. And this is talking about back in the 80s now things have happened recently and, and, and they've kind of always been back there i've always found them to be very fascinating second tier characters i've never really liked them when they brought been brought to the first tier. i actually like how they're used in this book for the most part okay. i yeah, mean there's uh, a lot of stuff fine. going on and i think they're fine in this book i the most interesting found them to be was and it was in a more more recent run it was probably within the last five years or something but it's after it's like yeah she's broken up from black bolt she's on earth She's yeah. kind of being her own person and like dating people and stuff. And I was like, this is actually really, interesting. yeah. Tell me more about this character. And it, I, that is the only time I've been like, Oh, I really want to learn more about one of these characters. Right. So that's, and that's kind of where I'm at with it too. Is like, I do like some of these characters and how they interact. I, I like them on a small scale, but you know, on a whole inhumans are how the inhumans are, but you know, let's talk about the ongoing saga of Gene and Scott. Okay, let's talk about soap operas. All right, I let's don't think talk we need about to these. Talk about let's it. talk about these. This telenovela. As much as I liked, especially during the time, the issues that were going on with Scott and Gene, and will they, won't they get back together? And you know, he's got his wife and all that stuff. I was like, ah, come on. The only thing I liked about this was that this was their chance to go and actually be on the blue area of Moon, where Phoenix died. Mm-hmm. No, that was actually kind of interesting because it was a uh, a good crux, and it seemed like it actually branched off a, a, a talking point. Yes, where she could kind of say, "You know what? It was a different person. It's not me. You did love her, thinking that it was me, but it was a different person, creature right. entirely. Why don't Why don't we go and pay some respects? And you can I don't know if she said it at the end or not, but it was like, "Why don't you tell me about her?" Kind of thing. Yeah. All right, all that. Aside, um, you'll break out the library card, finding literature in this comic book. It's called The Man in the Moon. Now, 
The Man in the Moon is a book by the Church of England Bishop Francis Goodwin, who was, you know, very old. This is, we're talking uh, 16th century type of thing. This work is notable for its role in what was called New Astronomy, a branch of astronomy influenced especially by Nicholas Copernicus. Now, I did not read this book, but I did look up some different reviews of it to kind of get an idea about it. The book deals with a voyage of Domingo Gonzalez that ends in a shipwreck. He discovers a giant wild swans and contrives a way to fly to the moon. There he meets a group of beings inhabiting what appears to be a utopian paradise. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> the book is thought to be one of the first science fiction books ever written, which is very that's Im- fascinating. That's impressive. Yeah. It ties together religious and scientific thoughts of the day, specifically that the Earth turns on its axis and the concept of heavenly spirits as well. Now, to be fair, the lunar excursion is just one part of the book, but I wanted just to draw attention, more attention to it because it's an interesting source of the idea that people living on the moon, something that has been adopted in many different writers since, and especially with our story here. Our story deals with a race of superhumans, godlike beings, if you will, that live on an area of the moon that is that is habitable. Now, in the comic book stories, this area was developed by an ancient race, and the inhumans just came in and they took it over. But it is fascinating to think that a lot of that thought and ideas and concepts have developed not recently, but way back in the 16th century. That I thought was very, very interesting that this idea has been around for a long time and it is not just a recent invention or an invention of Marvel. So there you go. I did not dis- expect to discover that. No, that's actually really kind of neat. And hey, we learned something and that's uh well, I didn't know that that was the technical first science fiction book that's been written. Yeah. Man of the Moon. You, you would think it's more like Jules Verne's type of a thing or something like yeah. that. But no, yeah, you think back that far and you, you wouldn't even think that science fiction would be allowed to be written. <laughs> or thought of to be written. Sure. But yeah. yeah. And, you know, transported up there through giant swans, which, all right, sure. Hey, you got to get up there somehow. Exactly. Basically. That's all it boils down to. And I mean, you know, not like we're talking real science or anything. That's your job. Ah. In the very beginning of this issue, we have Franklin Richards telling the Power Siblings about his special dream. In this dream, Quicksilver picks him up and runs him all the way to the moon. Well, my question for that is, how long would it take Quicksilver to do this? Let's start with a known factor, which is the distance of the moon from the Earth. That distance is 238,900 miles. And that kind of seems like a long way for a person to go on foot. Now let's look at how fast Quicksilver can run. He was originally capable of running faster than the speed of sound, which is 770 miles per hour. We do some math and find out that it would take him about 310 hours to run to the moon. That is almost 13 days. But good news for him, though. After being captured by the High Evolutionary, his powers were upgraded by Isotope E, and his running speed was increased until he was capable of easily high supersonic speeds between Mach 4 and Mach 5. At Mach 5, Quicksilver can run at 3,691 miles per hour, and at this speed, it would take him 65 hours, or about 2.7 days, to reach the moon. So, there you have it. That is how long it would take him to run to the moon, if he had a road or the ability to survive in space for an extended period of time. And that's this week's Science Corner. Fascinating. I think we both came up with some interesting, interesting contributions. Yeah, I have no idea how long it would take to get there by giant swan. Now, my one question for you, though, is uh, can he really run that long without stopping? Uh, <laughs> he's like the power pack. Can't, can't stop, won't never stop. That's just... I don't know. Uh, I have no clue on that. Uh, he can run a lot. He can run fast. Uh, but again, there's a whole number of insurmountable things in his way, such as atmosphere and space. Let me see if I can just, you know, dig you out of this hole. I, you know, threw you in. Um, let's talk about some power thoughts. Right. Let's talk about some refrigerator gallery. Let's talk about some art that we want to take out of this book. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of art because there's a lot of pages. There's uh, 48 pages of art. There's 48 pages of art. We're looking at four each. Let's talk about what I think as my backup joke one. I would like to go to page 35 on this one. Quicksilver is... Throwing some punches, throwing some fists at good old Beast. Ah. And we see uh, Biff Boff, Biff Boff. And um, 
Uh, I actually called this one Tickle Tickle. <laughs> because, yes, he is, you know, punching him. But I also can say, if he just put out his little fingers, he would go and Tickle 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 Beastie yeah. Beastie. Yeah, and that, that would also work funny. as well. Well, my joke up backup one is on the exact same page, and it's on the panel right adjacent to yours. And I call it Boop. And this has uh, Quicksilver holding Franklin. And okay, now what, what Quicksilver's going to do is terrible because he has got a hold of Franklin and he's got his upraised open hand and he's going to smack the face of our, you know, our young, uh, everybody's favorite, Franklin Richards. But uh, I'm more focusing on the foreground, which is Beast, who it shows him like reaching kind of towards the two of them. His, his big old left-handed pointer index finger is just about to touch you know, the, the kind of the, the image of uh, Franklin's nose. So I call it boop because uh, Beast is going to boop him on the nose and it's super cute. That could have gone so bad. Oh, yes, it could have. In so many ways. Yeah. I'm not paying attention to the background. I'm paying attention to the cute booping a child on his nose. All right. I'm going to move back a couple pages to page 27. And I'm going to call this one. That is painful. And it's on the bottom. <laughs> and it's Medusa as she's, uh, you know, strapped to this wall connected to this wall and her arms are back up behind her body and they've got her bent forward and i mean i know this should be a joke one i mean i should make make some funny here but this just looks painful mm -hmm. and and i wanted to call it out yeah okay so it's it's not a top joke it's a top i need to discuss something here the joke is well I can now do this yoga pose. <laughs> There's the yeah. joke. There is some dislocation looking going on there. It's, it's Actually, the joke is Franklin looking up saying, is that hurt? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the real joke is, Medusa, you have prehensile hair that's super strong. Why aren't you doing anything with your hair to do anything to save yourself there, Medusa? Because you're all bound up with your hands and your feet, but you still got your prehensile hair, which is your main thing of way of doing stuff medusa with your parents jeff's favorite character in this issue is medusa uh yeah super in love with her in this All issue right. she's super swell what's your top uh joke one my top joke one is on page 32 and i call it tiny Iceman. It is in the bottom left-hand corner, and it's when Karnak is freeing Gorgon and Iceman is freeing Medusa from uh, their bonds. But uh, it just looks like it's the cutest little tiniest kind of half or quarter-sized Iceman in the background, and he's freeing giants from their thing. And I just thought it was super cute. Yeah, it, there, there's some perspective work that's a little funky in that one, I bet. Uh, there's really that. Uh, this has a lot of perspective issues in it throughout the entire comic, where it's just kind of like... Yeah, I know that's a background thing that's going on, but that looks pretty foreground. It's uh, and in this case, it really looks like a tiny ice man. Tiny yeah, ice man. Tiny ice man. Gonna put him in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go to for my um backup good ones. I'm gonna go to the last page, and this is where we've got Quicksilver in the nursery with Luna, and he's talking to her. And there's a scene right at the end. It's the last panel with him in it. Where he's holding her and her face is really up close. You don't see all of Quicksilver's head, just a portion of it, and you see him crying a tear. Oh yeah, face. yeah. I I really liked that. I got really touched by that one. I thought it was really good. No, I see that. I totally see that. That that, that is great, and it shows emotion. It also shows, hey, you know how Medusa was telling everybody that he had been mind controlled. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, now Medusa might find out that he has not been mind controlled now because oh, and he's going to take care of his daughter, and that's touching. It really is. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. What do you got? My backup favorite is on page 17, and I call it All Hail Lockjaw. I like that one. <laughs> um, you know what? You, you got my top one. Oh, that really? was my top one. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that, it's the top right-hand panel, and it has uh, Quicksilver and Power Pack. Everybody's surrounding Lockjaw and, like, uh, looking at him in awe, and uh, Iceman Bobby Drake is uh, kneeling in front of him as though to worship him and his tuning fork crown goodness so he looks like he looks like an elephant in that one. yeah and then that's kind of cool i like lockjaw yeah lock everybody likes lockjaw i don't think you ever meet anybody who says <laughs> lockjaw what do you got for your top one since you took my top one since i stole your toppy well since i stole your top one i will gift you my top one <laughs> and it is on page 25 and i call it gleaming ice bottom panel 
of it's basically half the page. It's the bottom half. And it is uh, showing Beast and Iceman and Triton and Karnak and Black Bolt all standing around. But I just love the way that they uh, showed Iceman in this. He's in his ice-encased form, and it's just shining. He's like a diamond. You can hear the crystal sound coming off. Of yeah, his. you just hear the gleam. He's all gleam. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It just looks great. So that's that's my favorite. I just really like the way that yeah, uh, Iceman I, I, looks in this. Iceman looked pretty darn good in that. I mean, Ice. You know what the coolest part about Iceman is? If you say an insult at him, it just slides off the ice. <laughs> but not everybody's that lucky. Uh, not everybody's got that kind of power. Most true. of the time, they got glue because the insult sticks to them. Oh, that's right. Rubber and glue moment. Mm -hmm. One of the best or most childish insults. Mm -hmm. So the backup one, what do you got? It is Quicksilver after he's been grabbed by Leech, so he doesn't have his superpowers, and uh, Leech is all, stay. And Quicksilver's all, release me, you grotesque annoyance. Yeah, that'd be my top one right yeah, there. That's yeah, that's a that's a goodie. That's a grotesque good one. annoyance. Grotesque annoyance. Uh, grotesque annoyance. Good words. Those are good words mm -hmm. from a jerk. A jerk. Well, sorry, sorry that I stole your top one. What's your backup then? My backup one is on page twenty-seven, and I, I apparently I like this page. I've gone here a few times. But this one's got Maximus and Medusa talking to each other. And Medusa says, Maximus, you madman. Yes? Let me go. Never. I may be crazy, but I never said I was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's one of those self-referential uh, self insults, you yeah. know? Yeah, which is pretty fun. That was really pretty good. What's your top one? My top insult is on page five, and it is on the top of that, and it is from Katie, and it's when uh, Franklin has told everybody his special dream, and uh, everybody's kind of doubting him and everything, but uh, Katie's response to that is simply, of course not, Julie. The big baby had a nightmare that scared him. That's all, and now he wants to scare us. Big baby had a nightmare. Big baby. Yeah, just it's what so dismissive and insulting. Baby. <laughs> I just, I'm like, Katie, you are so you. And I just thought it was a really great one. There are a lot of big babies in this book. Mm -hmm. But who's the best and worst big baby? <laughs> Stars in detention. Stars in detention. What do you got? Uh, we're just doing the power pack, right? Just doing power pack. Okay, well, let's see who the uh, worst. I'm going to say Julie. Really? Yeah. Why do you say Julie? I don't remember. <laughs> Okay, the reason why I picked Julie was because I don't think she really did anything in this, like, at all. I mean, you know... Uh, didn't have a real big use of her power. No, she didn't really have any use of her power. Uh, like, her biggest contribution is her kind of saying that Franklin wouldn't lie to scare us about what he saw in a dream, and then... And uh, it? Yeah, I can kind of see where you're going with that. I uh, I didn't have that much of a problem with her, but uh, I don't know. I, I think I was fine with her mostly. My my worst, and you're probably going to have problems with this one, is Franklin. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I don't. I don't have terrible problems with that. I I, I just. I found that he's smarter than this. He didn't really serve more of a per much of a purpose except being a football. Yeah, he was just getting passed around, and 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 he is smarter than this. He's yeah. he's cleverer than this. He he knows a lot of these players, and it just seems like why didn't he interact more? Why wasn't he more of a factor involved or things happening? Could have done a lot more stuff. He didn't need to be held all the time by by Quicksilver. He could have done things to try to break away. Yeah, he really he was very passive. Yes. He came in to say. Uh, here is my tail. Oh, what are, you know, it's like the moon's going to explode and a man stole me. What are we going to do about that? N nothing. I just wanted to tell you. Yeah. Uh, in, just in case, just as a heads up, uh, just so you know. Oh, I've been kidnapped. Okay. Um, there's a lady who's awkwardly all bound up. Hi, lady. Yeah. Just not, not nothing really much. Nothing no, really much. Yeah. He was just, he was very much, yeah, there as well. Yeah. yeah he, yeah, he was a MacGuffin for... Mind control device powers, and yeah, I, I could see that. Let's 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 move on to uh, our best ones. Yeah, what do you got for your best? I'm gonna say Alex. I do too. Oh, okay. How come? 
I say good leadership. He worked with Jack to push over Quicksilver, which I thought was pretty great. That's a big one right there. And, and I just think that he was in charge of the situation. Yeah, and he was also the one who was like, okay, Katie, get out of the uh, the leech field and go find some people to help. Go find X Factor or something. Yeah, he just did a lot of good stuff in this. Yeah. So I, I think he was he was a good, good boy. Yeah, he was a good boy. He was a very good boy. Good, good boy. Good, good boy. Good, good boy. Now, you're, this is going to be just loving for you because, you know, we actually have the moon here, and we're talking G powers, and oh, we're talking yeah. G force. Oh yeah. First, there's no Gs. No zero Gs, and it's a standalone issue. It doesn't matter. All right. Yeah, we don't we don't count it in the uh, in the off main script. You know what we do count? What do we count? Top grades. Oh, we do count top grades. That is a thing we count. We want to evaluate this against all the rest of the issues, and um, I'm just going to go ahead and say, let's scroll on down. What? Let's just scroll on down. How far down are you going? It's a shock. Why am I already looking at the lower half of the uh, thing? Wow, I don't know why. It's it's, it's forty eight pages, king size. Yeah, uh, Power Pack was in half of it. Uh, I know, Power yeah. Pack had a good showing in it. They did have a good showing in it. Um, I'm gonna say this. I think that this is actually worse than the Thor issue with this cursed earth. Wow, because. That issue, at least, was part of some storylines okay. that Power Pack had to do things with. That is very true. Uh, this one was not. I do like the interactions that they had with other people and, uh, and other things. It's just that I would have liked more for them. Mm -hmm. I think they could have done more with the story. I would have liked them. You know what? You already had a half mob of people up on the moon anyways. Why not just bring them with you? It could have thrown more people up. Yeah, yes. Um... I think that if Power Pack got got kidnapped up there with X-Factor, I might have enjoyed it more. I could see that. Yeah, they really nerfed from about the get-go. It was them in a park. That's yeah. cool. I, I like seeing day-in, day-out yeah. stuff with, the, with Power Pack. I love that. But then when it was time for them, it's like, hey, costume's on. Well, that's all we can do. We can change our clothes. Uh, then otherwise, we can be little kids and we can be back an adult. Yeah. They're, and done. That was basically it. They, it. Yeah. Uh, hey, Kitty, go run for help. Gonna, but man, they really occupied Quicksilver for however long it took because Scott and Jean had to go and do a costume change. Right. And uh, I bet that took a while. So Quicksilver, even though Julie was kind of like, hey, he's a lot bigger than us. We aren't going to win this. They still took care of him for however long it took for adults to get changed and then come back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I got issues with that. So yeah, I, I, it's, I, any... it's not... it's. I don't. Yeah, it wasn't a great power pack story, but they were in it a fair amount. But yeah, and it, uh, yeah, yeah, I can I'm, see that. I'm gonna I drop it at the bottom. Am fine with it. It can be the new foundation, the bedrock upon which we build upon. Let's talk about this beer. Yep. How are we liking it? Uh, I. Every time I pick it up and drink it, I have to stop the show for a bit and let my face and tongue recontort into a manner into a shape that allows words to come out. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Gonna, here, let me try it again. Again, it smells kind of nice. Right. And it looks really good. It looks like honey and it smells nice. Ah, oh, ah, oh, I just, <sighs> here's the thing is that I like, there, there's a middle part after I take the drink. Okay. And after I let it settle. Yeah. That I like it. Yeah. And then the final aftertaste is like, eh. Yeah. There's a moment in the midst that I enjoy it. Okay. I could kind of see that. But, uh, but that's about it. See, I get this real, just, it's like, it just punches my mouth, uh -huh. you know, just like the back of the tongue throat area. And then I get this real musty flavor, of which I don't like. And uh -huh. then uh, it mellows out into kind of a, like, old, too old fruit yeah. kind of a flavor. So I'm not really digging it. Uh, no. I, <sighs> what are you going to let it, what are you going to land on with it? I've had worse. Yes. I'm only I'm gonna give this like a two. Yeah, I think I'm two gonna go power balls, I think. I think I'm gonna go a little above you. I'm gonna say two and a half. Oh that's that's gratuitous of you. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. There's a part that I do like, but I'm I'm with you on the two. So so yeah, um Spaceman double IPA. Not for um, us. Not for us. You 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 have a bit of a of a sour cheese in there. Yeah. <laughs> ah, you and your cheese jokes. <laughs> wah, 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 cheese. And that leads us to Kid's Perspective, and that's where Rick talks to his daughter, Carrie, about the issue at hand. So, Rick and Carrie, why don't you tell us your tale? Hi, Carrie. Hi, Daddy. How are you today? Good, and you? I'm doing pretty good. I was just 
getting you down here so that we can talk about this X Factor annual. What do you think about it? It barely has power pack. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And two, lots of stuff happened. You were very correct. That's exactly what Jeff and I said. There's a lot of stuff that happened. Can you try to just summarize for it, or what What did you take from it? Franklin was... Okay, so the man of the moon stole Franklin. And so he kidnapped Franklin. Why? Something because of his boss. That's right. This one guy wanted to cap kidnap him, right? Yeah. But you, there was a lot of stuff going on there, wasn't it? Was it, yeah. confu- was it confusing for you? Sort of. If we focus on just the Power Pack stuff, did you like that? Did you like Power Pack and, their, and how they were at the beginning of the book? Yeah. What did you like about them? I like how they actually help, tried to help him. What about how they were playing with Artie and Leech? Well, they were being nice to Artie and Leech. Yeah, and they were playing with them too, yeah. right? Uh-huh. Kind of nice to see them just doing a little bit of normal stuff at the beginning, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, no. They were only playing with Leech because Artie was shy. But they were trying to play with Artie, yeah. right? So it was a pretty confusing book beyond that, right? Yeah. Did you like it or not like it? It was good. It was good? Yeah, just good. Just good. It didn't seem like it was a very strong recommendation from you, though, right? No. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else you really want to talk about about this book? Not really. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. I love you. Love you, too. And now it's shout-out time! We want to recognize those listeners that take time to write in or leave us a review. This is for episode 40, where we talk about issue number 30. AJ. Al Sedano and the Warlock Thanos podcast. CH0 Space. Colin Stapleton and the worst comic podcast ever. David Adler. Doc Strange. Fan Film Fridays. Gibson, who thought we did an amazing job with a tough storyline. Thanks. Green Lantern HG. Hoover Jeremiah. Jeff Polier. Jeffrey Brown. Jeremy Daw. Jeremy Wiggins. Keith Baker. Corey. Kyle Sinelli. Let's Talk New Warriors. Limax 7. The Long Box Crusade. Mal. Matt Roberts. Max Traver. Mr. Rogers Core. Mitch Gillian. NZ Waffles. Osvaldo Oyola. And the Middle Spaces website. Patrick R. Carey. Radioactive Dog Welder. And he says... Hearing Carrie say, don't do crack, on the podcast is adorable, hilarious, and strangely scary. Yeah, we can agree to that. Rob Earhart. Sailor Bear Zodar. Secret Wars and Beyond podcast. He remembers this being a rough period of the book, and is hoping we can help him see it differently. Dabbing Contest. And they really liked our live recording and thanked us for the sensitive treatment we gave issue number 30. Thor Edison, who was happy to see a beer that is in his fridge. Well, we did break in and look. Too much information? Tim Price, Podcrasher, who also wrote to us to let us know that he really liked our handling of issue number 30. We might have done a good job on that. It's sounding like it. It was a, kind of a sensitive issue, and we kind of tried to skirt that uh, sensitive, unsensitive line, and I think we hopefully did it pretty well. So Pardon. I hope everybody enjoyed, and uh, if anybody found any offense in it, please tell us, so that, that way we can kind of curb our enthusiasm. And it looks like we have another patron, Doug Jones. Thank you for supporting us, Doug. Dig the devilishly devastating deeds of Doug. And we should probably take a moment to thank our current patrons. Brian Char, Charles Charlie, Chris, Doug, Edward, Emily, Getty, Jeff, Matthew B., Matthew L., Recap Podcast, Sailor Bear Zodar, Stephen, Tim, and Todd. Be sure to check out our other shows that we're on, Rick Meets the Legion, which you can find at Comic Reflections, and our junior agent submissions on MI6 Rookie Agents episodes of On Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. And we have some merchandise available on Redbubble. Go to redbubble.com and search for Unpacking the Power of Power Pack. Jeff and Rick Presents is a bi-weekly self-produced podcast recorded in front of a very tired couple of guys who've been recording way too much today in Portland, Oregon. And if you'd like to interact with us through the magic of the internet, you can do so at Twitter at Jeff and Rick Present, our Facebook page, Jeff and Rick Present, our email address, Jeff and Rick Present, all one word, at gmail.com, and our website, Jeff and Rick Present dot WordPress dot com. And if you would like to help us support our show, we are on Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com. Jeff and Rick present, all one word. We are also a supporter of the Hero Initiative, and we will be donating 10% of our Patreon donations to this great cause. We encourage everyone to give what they can to this worthwhile organization that helps the creators who provide us with such great content. Go to heroinitiative.org to find out more. Please rate and review us wherever you can. Tell your friends about us or share your love for us on social media. 
And as always, we want to thank the powerful people in our packs. My wife, Cindy, and our daughter, Carrie. My fiance, Hillary, and our daughter, Aurora. We love, love you. Until next time, costumes, costumes off. off. Our theme music is 80s action. All speech in this episode is dangerous. All music is by Kevin McLeod at acoptech.com and is licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. On the 3,300... It's not hard, it's numbers. <coughs> TSR. <laughs> <laughs> Intro music. TSR. It's our game. It's the place that we will stay. It's the game company for you and me. <coughs> Welcome, dear listener, to our podcast. Jeff and Rick presents Unpacking the Power of Power... No, oh, shoot, I screwed this up. <laughs> I know, I did this. Did I do this or did you do this? You wrote this. I wrote this. <coughs> Tom Grinberg. Grinberg? Grin- Grinberg. We'll do Grinberg. <coughs> there we go, I'm classy. We've established I'm not. <coughs> <coughs> okay, as an aside, what, I, what's the joke on Delaware? Wayne's World. Uh, Remember the green screen? Oh. And we're a green screen. Oh, that's for, okay, thank you. There now, we go. In Delaware. Delaware. Cool. That's <laughs> right. Okay, I completely forgot that. I, 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 just, I, what'd, I, you do, what'd you do that? Delaware. Cool. <clears throat> home of the Fighting Blue Arenas. Aryans. Home of the flighty... Home of the Fighting Blue Aryans. Jeez. <clears throat> <sighs> oh, oh, so clever. <laughs> just say no. I'm Gorgon. Gonna, I'm... <laughs> I'm going to. I just. <clears throat> <clears throat> a couple other important people in the room are the king and queen of the yum yum. And possibly shake the cheese land to salad crumbs. Salad crumbles. <clears throat> and possibly shake the. I'm sorry. Here. Hi, Herbie. I'll pet you for a bit, but you need to be quiet. Really? <clears throat> Yo, is let's do this. Colors, 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 colors. 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 colors.